Ewald collected strains of cholera bacteria from South America and measured the amount of toxin they produced, an indication of their virulence. Over time, he would document evolution in action. If you have contaminated water allowing transmission, we expect the cholera organism to evolve to a particularly high level of harmfulness, and that's exactly what we see. We find that bacteria that had invaded countries with poor water supplies evolved increased harmfulness over time. They've actually become more toxigenic. They produce more toxin than they did at the outset. If instead we clean up the water supplies, then we force the bacteria to be transmitted only by routes that require healthy people. And what we find is that when cholera invaded countries with clean water supplies, the organism dropped in its harmfulness. Those bacteria evolved lower levels of toxin production. They actually became more mild through time. People would still be getting infected, but the infections would be so mild that most people won't even be sick. So, the cholera outbreak in Latin America suggests that we may need only a few years to change the cholera organism from one that would often kill people to one that hardly ever causes the disease. What we're suggesting here is that we can domesticate these disease organisms very much in the same way that we've domesticated other organisms that are potentially harmful. For example, wolves have been harmful to us throughout our evolutionary history, but through domestication, some wolves have evolved into dogs that instead of harming us, actually help us. And I think we can do the same thing with these disease organisms. Working with evolution instead of against it, we might eventually subdue even the deadliest microbes. Evolution has already forged such surprising truces. Okay. Most wild cats have evolved a way to live with a virus closely related to one that is decimating humans. The story was unraveled by Stephen O'Brien, here at the National Zoo to examine a tranquilized cheetah. Well, we originally became interested in the cats because I was interested in the interplay between infectious diseases and the genes of the species that suffer them. We began working with cheetahs and subsequently started to study each of the 37 different species in the cat family. What we're learning from them is that they are mirrors of evolutionary processes in humans. It all began in the 1980s, when O'Brien became concerned that small populations of endangered cats were especially vulnerable to the ravages of infectious disease. Then he heard that domestic cats were falling prey to a newly discovered and lethal virus, the feline immunodeficiency virus, or FIV. FIV is associated with very skinny and malnourished and wasting disease in house cats. And that disease was the result of the collapse of the immune system. So the parallels with human immunodeficiency virus were very strong. I was curious as to whether or not the virus had also been able to infect non-domestic cats. O'Brien had collected biological specimens from thousands of wild cats around the world. He began to screen them for the presence of the virus. Well, when we did that in cheetahs from East Africa and the pumas in, in the Rockies and the ocelots down in the Andes and the lions in the Serengeti. It turned out that virtually every species of cats on the planet had been exposed to and infected with a version of feline immunodeficiency virus. 
Well, I was terrified because I thought that we were just a heartbeat away from a epidemic that was going to decimate some of these cats. And since 36 of 37 of these cat species are already considered endangered or threatened, then this could be the final wallop. For years, O'Brien feared the worst. He urged zookeepers and game wardens around the world to test their animals for the virus and to watch for AIDS-like symptoms. What we discovered, though, over time is that these cats were really not getting ill. It was as if they had somehow come up with a resistance to a fatal virus. O'Brien's research suggests FIV first infected the cat's ancestors around one million years ago. It decimated the animals. But a few cats carried mutations that made them resistant to the virus. These survivors passed on their protective genes to their offspring and to most wild cats alive today. Over time, the virus may also have evolved into less lethal strains. Today, wildcats and FIV have reached the end of a long evolutionary process and have adapted to each other. Humans and HIV only recently embarked on the path that might eventually lead to a truce. But the example of the wild cats convinced O'Brien there must be people endowed with mutations that protect them from HIV. He set out to find them. Over a 10 year period of time, I quietly collected blood samples from 10,000 individuals that are high risk. My colleagues and I extracted the DNA and we were stunned to discover a whopping mutation which protected against HIV infection. And it was the first gene that we could definitively say was influencing the outcome of exposure to this deadly virus. Most people have receptors on their immune cells that allow HIV to dock and gain entry. But people with the mutation discovered by O'Brien lack some or all of these receptors. Infection by HIV becomes impossible. The mutation is present in about 10% of European Caucasians, but completely absent in native African and East Asian peoples. Something in the evolutionary history of Caucasians must have favored the survival of people with this mutation. We've actually used precise dating techniques to date the last time such a selective pressure took place. And that came out 700 years ago. Well, if you look in the history books, that was the time of a rather dramatic infectious disease uh, pandemic, which was the Black Death or the bubonic plague. And at that time, a third of Europeans were wiped out. A mutation that saved people from the plague seven centuries ago may now protect their descendants from infection by HIV. Today, when we scroll through the genes of cats or humans, we discover that they're littered with these footprints of historic epidemics that have defined the survival of today's living species. We all bear the marks of our ancestors' struggle for survival. But evolution is driven not just by conflict and competition. Cooperation and teamwork have also ensured the survival of the fittest. Toward the end of the 20th century, biologists began to realize that there's another force, equally important and responsible for the buildup of a great deal of the magnificent superstructure of the Earth's biodiversity, and that is cooperation. What we call symbiosis, and particularly mutualistic symbiosis. That is, intimate living together of different kinds of organisms in which there is a partnership 
which benefits both of the partners. 